Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Man, we've been in a series over the last few weeks called uh, Holiday Road. And uh, Edward uh, talked about last week this whole doctrine of vacation and how uh, the Sabbath plays into our life. And we're going to be doing this all summer. And so if you're traveling this summer and you're on vacation, we invite you to take a picture, put it on your social media account, use the hashtag SHFVacation. If you don't know what a hashtag is, ask your grandchildren, okay? And they'll be able to do that for you. Also, feel free to take pictures in our sandbox beach thing that we've got set up out there, and you can post those as well. Uh, I don't normally preach in shorts, but it is summertime, and since we're in a series called Vacation, I might as well look like I'm on vacation. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, Edward is actually on vacation, and um, since we're streaming live or we're taping this and he may be watching on vacation, I mowed your yard yesterday, Edward, and so I want you to know that. Now, before you give me any do-gooder praise, I expect you, Edward, to do the same when I'm gone in a few weeks, okay? It's a little trade-off there. All right. Well, today we're going to be talking about asleep at the wheel. And it's interesting, I was telling Paula this morning uh, as we were opening up, I said, you know, it's funny, on Mother's Day, we praise the mothers, right? On Mother's Day, we lift the mothers up. On Mother's Day, man, we love on the mothers, and it's all about how wonderful the mothers are and all this good stuff. And on Father's Day, we're going to hammer the dads, all right? And so um, I, I, I want you to know that I am preaching to me today, okay? And so you have two choices, okay? You can leave now, all right, because this will be directed towards me, or you can stay and see if any of this applies to you, amen? All right, and then we'll wrap it up. And ladies, there's application here for you as well. I don't want to alienate you, but you had your day last month. This is our day, all right, as fathers. Now, I feel a huge amount of pressure as a dad, I mean, massive, massive amount of pressure. I mean, the pressure to get it right, you know? I'll never forget when Boston, my oldest son, when he was, oh man, couldn't have been more than four months old, maybe even less than that. Ashley and I had come home from the grocery store, and we had him in the carrier, and I set him down, and we were unloading groceries, okay? And I, at that time, we lived in a house where the kitchen and the living room were basically, basically the same. I mean, it was separated by a little, a little island bar. And I'm sitting there, and I'm unloading groceries, and I walk around the bar, and I walk to the bedroom, and I look and Boston, little four-month-old Boston, was sitting in his car seat, and I noticed that his eyes locked on me and followed me across the room. So I did what any dad would do. I'd say, Ashley, watch this. <laughs> I said, look, his eyes are following me. And I'll never forget what she said. She said, and you know what? They're going to be every day from this day forward. That's when it hit me. I'm a dad, and there's an amount of pressure that comes with being the spiritual leader of your home as a dad, that we would lead our families in a way that would honor God, that we would lead in such a way that our children would grow up to love God, that we would lead our wives in such a way where they feel safe and they feel comfortable, and they feel like uh, that they're being led by, by a man who is secure in who he is and, and knows what he's doing and all, and all these other things. But there's an enormous amount of pressure that comes with that. 
And then you add in the fact that I'm a pastor. And the pressure and the expectations really begin to ramp up. Because as a pastor, my kids are supposed to be perfect, right? I mean, my family is supposed to be perfect, right? I'm glad y'all are shaking your head no, because that's not the way it works. But here's the reality, dads. We're all leading our families somewhere, okay? And if we're honest with ourselves, I think we would admit there have been seasons in our lives where we've been asleep at the wheel, where maybe not even really knowing it, but just uh, going through a season where we've checked out in certain areas. We're at a time now, Boston's in middle school, and we're having to make some really tough decisions with him. And even Ainsley is a third grader. I mean, with the, the tablets and the, and the TV and what comes on and who you let them, you know, spend the night with and where you let them go and, and all these other things. And, and, and as a leader, you know, every decision that I make, every step that I take is going to affect my family. And so I, I'm, it doesn't matter if I go this way or if I go that way. It doesn't matter if I make this decision or if I make that decision. It will determine where our family goes as the head of the house. And so we're leading our families somewhere. And I think the place where I tend to doze off the most is in this area of integrity. And I want to talk about this for a second because I feel like it's important. You know, when Edward asked me to speak on Father's Day and he said, you know, we're doing this vacation series and I want to, I want to, I want to uh, uh, teach our fathers uh, this whole concept of falling asleep at the wheel and, you know, waking up and where we're leading our families, I really struggled with, well, where do I go with this? Because the church thing to do would be like, well, we'll just tell them to raise their kids in the way of the Lord, right? That's too generic for me. Or we just, well, make sure that you, as dads, as you're bringing your kids to church, you know, every Sunday. Well, I don't buy that either. And so I really begin to pray, and I really begin to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, show me where I fall asleep. And this word integrity kept coming up over and over and over again. And I think for me, it's an issue of modeling integrity. Because as dads, remember our kids... In our wives, eyes are always locked on us. I don't know how many of you dads have sons, but every son wants to be like their dad. And so they're, they're locked on us, they're following us, they're, they're imitating us, they're learning from us. So, it, so modeling integrity, teaching integrity, you know, passing that down to, to, to my son and my daughter, And then leading with integrity as we make decisions, as we do life, as we go through this thing called the Christian life. I struggle with this, and I have a feeling that I may not be the only one. But what is integrity, and how do we walk in? And I want you to listen to a passage, and I just want you to listen today. I'm not going to throw verses up on the screen. Here in a minute, I'm going to ask you to turn to a passage. But, But for the most part, I just want you to listen. I want you to listen to God And something that he told Solomon, Solomon, all right, King Solomon. You have King David. How many of you heard of King David in the Old Testament? Okay, Solomon was his son. Okay, listen to what God says to to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 9. This is in verse 4. He said, as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked with integrity of heart and uprightness. Doing according to all that I've commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, and I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, just as I promised your father. God told Solomon, if you will walk before me in integrity, just like your father David did. I'll never forget the first time I read that, and I thought, David? Integrity? David? Integrity? The definition, Webster defines integrity as being the quality of being honest. David? And having strong moral principles. David? And moral uprightness. David. 
okay, God, what are you teaching me here? Because when we look at David's life, okay, we know that he was a great king. We know that he was a man after God's own heart. But what else do we know about David? David had a, oh, just a little hiccup, right? A small mistake in his life. I mean, he was on the top of his, I guess, castle house one day, and he sees a, a naked woman bathing, all right, on a roof. A woman that was not his wife, okay? A woman that was married to somebody else. David decides, okay, he didn't like stumble and, you know, he decides to take this woman, to sleep with this woman, okay, to have an affair with this woman, all right? This woman gets pregnant, and so David then goes into, he's, now he's an adulterer, then he goes into lying, deceiving, uh, cover-up mode, and he brings the woman's husband, whose name was Uriah, home from war, which David should have been at war. And he's like, okay, maybe I'll bring him home and they'll sleep together and we'll just say the baby's his. Uriah was uh, uh, such a, a, a faithful servant. He's like, no, we'll not sleep with her, okay, because we're at war, you know, and all this other stuff. And so David goes into panic mode, okay, so he's an adulterer, he's a liar, He's a deceiver. He's a manipulator, all right? And then he decides, I'll just be a murderer too. And so we'll take Uriah and we'll put him on the front line where nobody survives, and sure enough, Uriah dies, okay? And so now you have King David who has taken a woman that's not his wife. He's had an affair with her. He's gotten her pregnant, okay? And then he's killed the woman's husband, and God says that this man walked with integrity of heart and uprightness. So integrity can't just be what Webster says. Because if it was, God would not have made that statement. It can't be just all about making the right decisions all the time. Because if that was the case, then I would never have integrity. Because I've made some horrendous decisions as a Christian, as a husband, and as a father. It can't be never messing up. And we can even go as far as to say is that integrity really can't mean never not sinning. If... We're going to take God serious when he told Solomon, hey, your dad had integrity, and I want you to be the same. So according to, to what God told Solomon, there must be a way that we can live in integrity as dads, have integrity, even while making the most outrageous mistakes of our lives. Because how many of us dads have made some pretty ridiculous mistakes as dads? I know I have. And according to what God told Solomon, there must still be a way for us to have integrity. I can't believe I'm about to say this. Even while making a decision to be in sin. Has to be, or he would not have told Solomon what he told him. And so I read 1 Kings 9, 4 through 5, and I hear what God tells Solomon of his dad. And my, my first response was, David? Integrity? But the more I look into it, my response now is, praise God. That I can be human and make mistakes, and still be known as a man of integrity. So let's dive a little deeper into this. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now, David, I mean, this, this goes on, you know, and everything's hunky-dory, and, you know, and, you know he, he's gotten away with it, I guess, in his mind, all this other stuff. 
And then this, uh, this guy named Nathan shows up. Now, Nathan was a prophet, okay, a prophet of God. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we see a conversation where Nathan, the prophet Nathan, confronts King David, okay? And in verse 1, chapter 12, it says, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him. Now, what, what Nathan is about to tell David is sort of a parable-like story. You know, Jesus used parables in the, in the New Testament to, to make, a, make a point. That's kind of what uh, Nathan's about to do here. He's about to use an analogy uh, to make a point to David, all right? And so he tells, he tells David in verse 1, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. Verse 2, the rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Verse 4. Now there came a traveler to the rich man. All right, so the rich man's welcoming a guest. And he was unwilling to take of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So the rich man has a guest coming over, and even though the rich man has all the flock, I mean, everything that he could ever want, he takes the poor man's only lamb, all right, and serves that to his guest. All right, verse 5. So David's hearing this story, right? And in verse 5, David, David gets angry. Like, well, that's wrong, okay? Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, all right? So that Nathan is telling him this story, and David's like, well, I, that's just wrong, I mean, that's wrong of a man who has everything to take the one thing from this poor guy. I mean, who would do that? And so David says, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And so David's listening to the story Nathan tells. And boy, he's getting angry. And it's like, who would do such a thing? I mean, a rich man that has anything he could ever want, and he goes and takes the one thing that belongs to this poor man. A man like that deserves to die. And then in verse 7, and this is how I like to read Scripture. I'm very imaginative. So this is what I'm just telling you my interpretation of what I think this might have looked like. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are that man. You are that man. Boy, how many times as a man, as a dad, as a husband, have I been called out you know our wives know us best men and our children are not far behind we can't we can't fool them but how many times when they come to us and 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 they see something in us that we can't see what do we do what did David do? What was his response? Well, you don't understand, you know, she was naked for all the world to see. I mean, what am I supposed to do? I mean, you don't understand, Nathan. I mean, I'm a guy. It's just, it's what guy, it's just how we're wired, man. I mean, you don't understand. I mean, yeah, but... Verse 13, and this is how I like to imagine this happen. David said, oh, I have sinned against the Lord. No excuses. No, yeah, but. No, oh, but you don't understand. Just a simple, 
I have sinned against the Lord. He owned it. He owned it. You want to lead your family in integrity? You want to make sure that you never fall asleep at the wheel? Dads, we need to start owning our junk. You see, I told you earlier that I feel like there's many times where I don't feel like I'm modeling, teaching, or leading with integrity well. And I think it's because, I mean, I don't know how you grew up. I don't have time to tell you how I grew up. But, man, I just, I've been making excuses my whole life. I mean, in school, well, yeah, but, you know, the teacher, I mean, she didn't give us enough time. I mean, who's supposed to finish a project in a month? (laughs) You know, in life, yeah, but, you know, I mean, there was traffic, and, I mean, how was I supposed to know, you know? I mean, Dallas to Holly Lake Ranch, I mean, I gave it 30 minutes. I mean, we as humans are excuse makers. Our parents, the woman gave it to me, well, the snake. Well, the this, well, the that. I mean, whose fault was it? Wasn't mine. Wasn't mine. Wasn't mine. And as dads, remember, the eyes and the hearts of our children and our spouses are locked onto us. So when we become excuse makers, they learn very early on the yeah buts and the excuses. Because I really believe this is where we as fathers are snoozing, is in modeling to our families that it's, you're going to screw up. Nobody's perfect. You're going to make mistakes, and you're even going to sin. You're going to make some of the worst decisions of your life. You know, one thing I'm learning as a dad, my kids are 11 and 7. And I did. Early on as a parent, I, I was deceived and had the ridiculous idea that my kids were going to be the only people outside of Jesus, to never screw up. I don't know where I got that from. And so when they would mess up, I'd be like, ah, you can't do that. Well, I've seen you do that. And so what I'm learning is, is not if, but when I make a mistake It's better just to own it and to teach them to do the same. So here's where I am with all this, and here's where I think God has really spoken to me over the last few years. And I've I've wrestled with this passage for years, guys. I didn't just read that this week. Um, That's a verse, like I've got it printed off in a book or whatever because I, I I was really, I really dove into this a few years ago, this whole idea of David having integrity. And so this is where I kind of landed on this. Dads, if we want to lead well, then we've got to own our mistakes. We've got to get rid of excuses, okay? Now, if you're like me, okay, and I'm not not saying you are, but if you're like me, you're already telling yourself, but I don't really make that many mistakes. And if you're like me, you're probably thinking something along the lines of, and I would never do what David did. Just hang on. If I've heard that once, I've heard it a thousand times on the back end of an affair. We're all capable, okay? We're all capable of making horrendous mistakes, and most of us are already making some kind of mistakes. And so if we want to lead with integrity, let's back up a second and quit trying to be perfect. 
Let's stop thinking about integrity in terms of never messing up. Okay? Now, I'm not giving you license to mess up. Don't walk out of here and say, Jake said I could mess up. That's not what I said. Okay? I'm just, I'm a, Ashley thinks I'm a pessimist. All right? Which I am. But I like to hide it by saying I'm a realist. No, I'm just being, I'm just being realistic. Okay? You're going to mess up. All right? If you're a young dad, you're going to mess up. All right, you're going to wound your children. They're going to be in a counselor's office in about 25 years talking about you. It's going to happen. Okay? Just own it. Quit making excuses. Just own it. All right? Get rid of the excuses. This is a two part application. Number one, get rid of the excuses. Psalms 51, David wrote this psalm. All right, most scholars believe he wrote it in reference to what had happened with Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the lady's name that was bathing on the roof, okay? Listen to some of the things he says in this psalm. Psalms 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and listen to this, and blameless in your judgment. There's not one excuse in those four verses. He's owning it. And he's owning it to the point where he says, I did it. And not only have I done it, your judgment on me, like whatever you decide, and, and, and what ended up happening was, if you read the rest of, of the story, is, I mean, he didn't get off scot-free. I mean, son died, the kingdom split. I mean, it, 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 we're still feeling the effects of this today. I mean, there were huge consequences. Not one time did he say, yeah, but her fault, his fault, she fault, we fault, anything but my fault, never said that. And not one time did he say, and your judgment isn't fair. It's not fair. He owned it all. He said, yeah, I've sinned, and not only have I sinned, whatever you decide is fair, because I did this. He owned it. Number one, own it. Number two, choose the next right action. You always have an opportunity to make a different choice. Do you realize that we're always making choices? One of my favorite things to do is when I'm talking with a man, and I'm guilty of this too, it's just funny, okay? It's when I'm talking with a man, and let's say uh, somebody's broken an agreement, okay? Like somebody was supposed to call me at 7 o'clock, and they didn't call me. All right, it was an important call, and they didn't call me. And I asked them, and I said, well, what did you choose to do instead of calling me? I chose not to call you. Okay, what did you choose to do instead? Well, what do you mean? We're always making choices. Even if we choose not to do something, we're choosing to do something else. Does that make sense? David chose to get into that relationship. When he was confronted, he made a different choice. He chose the next right action. He chose to repent before God. He chose to own it. He chose to, uh, to, to be honest with everybody. I mean, he made a different choice. Our sin is always a sin against the Lord. You know, he said in Psalms 51, against you and you only have I sinned. I've always struggled with this because we know from circumstance that our sin is not just against God. Our sin affects other people. Our choices affect other people. Dads, the choices that we make will affect our families. There's no getting around it. And so when we break Integrity, by Webster's definition, 
Okay, remember Webster's definition, it's almost a perfection, like this moral uprightness, like you never make So when we break Webster's definition and we move into God's definition of integrity, which is own it, make a different choice, then we make a different choice to those that we've hurt as dads. I know for me, my family, my wife, my son, and my daughter all love gifts, like my daughter, if you want to communicate to Ainsley Connor that you love her, just give her a piece of candy. She thinks gifts are the way to go. And so what I find myself doing oftentimes as a dad, when, not if, but when I mess up royally, I feel like I have to get back in integrity with my family. Now, Sin against God, I can ask for forgiveness all day long, but I've got to show those people closest to me, and dads, that's my wife and my two children, I've got to show those people closest to me that I'm willing to make a choice and step back into integrity with them, and sometimes I'm sorry is just not enough. So what do I do? I do a simple act of service. I may take them somewhere, or I may uh, let them uh, watch the movie of their choice. I mean, it, I'm telling you, man, it's simple. It's not like we're not buying Ashley a Corvette, and we're not giving Ainsley the keys to the kingdom. I mean, I'm not, I didn't mess up that bad. <laughs> but it's a simple act of service that says, I made a bad choice, and I'm choosing to make a better choice, or it's making a new agreement with them, Daddy will take you to the movies Saturday, and then I make the choice not to screw that up. Does that make sense? So we own it, and then we choose the next right action. Could you imagine what a church would look like, what a community would look like, what a, what a world would look like where men we're leading their families in this kind of integrity. See, we've, we've, we've preached and we've taught for generations that, you know, could you imagine a church, could you imagine a world where men are never making mistakes and they're leading their families and they're bringing them to church and they're making them memorize scripture. And, okay, we've tried all that. How, how, how about this? Let's try this. Let's be a little bit more realistic. Let's imagine, let's create a world where we're modeling for our children that, hey, when you mess up and you will mess up, own it. Don't make excuses. Be a man of integrity. Be a woman of integrity. Step into that and say, you know what? I messed up. I chose the wrong thing. And I will now choose to do the right thing. What kind of disciples would we be making then? What kind of men would we be raising? What kind of women would we be raising? But more importantly than that, dads, let's just start with us. What kind of men, what kind of fathers could we be if we just stopped making excuses and owned our own junk, owned our mistakes, owned our sin? I'll never forget the first time I tried to model this. I told Ashley something about myself that I was not proud of. And I thought I was making this big confession, like I'm fixing to drop this bombshell on you, and blah, 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 blah. And I'll never forget her reaction. Oh, yeah, I've known that. <laughs> it's like, you, you have? Dude, everybody's known that. It's funny, isn't it? Just as David thought he could hide from God. I mean, even when the prophet Nathan comes, David still doesn't get. God already knows what he's been doing. The people that know us well, our wives, our children, they already know. They already know where you've screwed up. They see it. They live with it. Dads. You know what they're tired of? They're not tired of you messing up. They're tired of you making excuses. It's time to be men. 
It's time to be fathers. It's time to own it. So I challenge us today on Father's Day to wake up. We've been asleep at the wheel for far too long. Our children need us to be men like David. Our wives need us to be men like David. And maybe one day God would say of us, if you walk like your father Jake did, like your father Gary did, like your father Jim did, like your father Paul did, if you walk like that with integrity and uprightness, I'll bless you. Let's pray. I want to invite all the dads to stand as we close today. Not to embarrass you. Everybody else, we're still in a posture of prayer. And I, just, I, I would like to close this way. If you're, if you're a spouse or maybe a daughter or somebody sitting next to, to a dad, just put a hand on them. They may not admit it, but they feel an enormous amount of pressure in what they've been called to do. And so, Father, we come before you this morning and we lift up these men that you've given the incredible privilege of, of calling them to be dads and husbands. God, we pray. We pray for them. We bless them. And Father, we ask you to invade their hearts. And God, as David said in another psalm where he asked you to search him and know him to see if there was anything in there that just didn't fit. God, would you do that to us? God, I thank you for the example. I thank you that we have a collection of books where the men and women, the heroes of our faith were total, total mess-ups. And God, I thank you for grace. I thank you for giving us a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chance to do what you've called us to do. So God, bless these men as we celebrate them today, and we'll give glory to you and your son Jesus. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.